Okay, a very good morning once again from Berlin. I don't know if it's still your time zone uh, to, to be morning, but yeah, a warm welcome um, to this webinar um, about um, the key results of the State of Renewable Energies in Europe 21st edition. Um, my name is Christoph Wunsch with the Renewables Academy and I will be moderating the session and um, as you see on top already um, there's uh, um, yeah, our, our other speakers I will present them in a second. Um, so once again a warm welcome um, on behalf of the Europe server team and the European Commission. Um, in this webinar we want to present the key results um, of our overview barometer the state of renewable energies in Europe um, already the 21st edition. Um, before I go into the agenda and present the speakers to you, um, I would like to um, yeah, uh, notify you of a few housekeeping rules. Um, so first of all, um, please um, keep your cameras and microphones switched off. Um, there will be the chance to ask questions um, at the end of the webinar, and please feel free to use the chat for this. Um, the slides of this presentation, as well as uh, uh, the recording, um, will be uploaded to our website, so you can re revisit um, everything we present over here also at a later stage. As mentioned already, um, we have uh, some 10 to 15 minutes reserved for questions and answers. Um, this will be done at the end of the webinar. So please use the chat already during the presentations to ask your questions. I will direct them to our speakers afterwards. Um, but before we go into the agenda and the presentation of the speakers, um, I have a little um, a, a poll prepared just to see um, what's the, the background of our participants. So um, right now you should be seeing uh, this poll um, appear in your Zoom uh, window. So um, please feel free to yeah, uh, let us know what um, yeah, area, what sector you are from. Um, so actually, I see there's uh, it's quite a good mix already. We have representatives of associations, also of the energy industry, quite some people from research and academia, NGOs, and also consulting and think tanks are represented. All right, uh, perfect. Thank you so much. And um, I'll close this poll already and we'll move on to um, yeah, the presentation of our speakers. So um, as you see here, um, we have the uh, consortium of uh, rep uh, representing the countries of France, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. And um, you will be hearing first from Diane Lesco. She's uh, the uh, team lead and project uh, uh, coordinator from Observer in Paris, um, followed by Frédéric Thuyer. Um, he will be talking about the energy indicators. We have Lin Zheng from Fraunhofer Easy. Um, she will be presenting uh, renewable energy sources in heat heating and cooling, but also the new chapter on investment indicators. Then we have Floris Ullemann uh, from TNO in the Netherlands. Um, he will be talking about the socioeconomics, uh, energy costs and prices, innovation and competitiveness indicators, as well as trade indicators. Last but not least, uh, from uh, Vito in Belgium, we have Ilse Morkens, and she will be presenting the chapter on avoided fossil fuel use. So let's move on to the agenda. Um, and as mentioned already, um, We'll be presenting some key results of our new, uh, newest um, overview barometer, the state of renewable energies in Europe. So um, Diane will give us an overview of the project. Frederic will be talking about uh, some key energy indicators that Observer has uh, identified. Um, from Fraunhofer, we will hear on the uh, renewable energy sources in heat, heating and cooling in the buildings, in the building sector, as well as uh, investment indicators. Then TNO will present the social economic impacts, RES costs, uh, prices and cost competitiveness, um, the innovation and competitiveness indicators, and in between we have Vito Ilse Morkens uh, uh, presenting the avoided fossil fuel use and avoided greenhouse gas emissions. So um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Diane, um, and uh, she will give an overview um, of the project. So um, Diane, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Krista, for this introduction. Hello to everybody. I'm a deputy director of Observer, which is an association publishing magazines on renewable technologies, by the way, soon available in English, and also produces studies that are freely um, downloadable on the association website. Um, the Europe Server Barometer is a project that we have founded in 1999. I see that the slides, slides are not moving. You, I think you have to click once into the, um, yes. Okay, okay, sorry for that. Uh, we have founded this project in 1999 with the help of uh, the Commission, European Commission and ADEM, the French uh, Environmental Agency. The project has been continuously supported by these two organizations since then. ADEM uh, nowadays finances the translation of the barometers into French and the whole of the uh, project is financed by the Commission. As you probably already know, if you're participating in this uh, webinar, we release every two months a barometer focused on one of the REST uh, technologies with, the estimates, with estimates on the developments achieved in the preceding year and an analysis of uh, the sector dynamics in the light of the changes in uh, either the regulatory or support framework in the member states. At the end of the year, we prepare our annual report on the state of rest in Europe, uh, to which I will come back in a minute. We have very uh, diverse target groups from policymakers to European media, and an, uh, our audience triggers more than 100,000 downloads a year of uh, the different documents we publish um, on our website. Uh, you should soon see the publication schedule. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, we have just uh, finished the uh, photovoltaic barometer uh, that has been uploaded on the uh, website a couple of weeks, weeks ago, and we are now working on the solar thermal and CSP. Uh, barometer. Next will be biogas, resid transport, and solid biofuels. Uh, the highlight of our uh, work uh, in uh, the consortium is the production of the state of renewable uh, energies in Europe uh, barometer. Uh, this barometer uses Eurost Eurostat estimates for the energy indicators and sums up the thematic barometers published during the year. And it also adds the other technologies that have not been reviewed in a technical um, barometer, such as hydro and hy uh, geothermal. Uh, it includes as well additional information, um, such as the rest shares and additional subchapters on specific topics, sorry, on specific to topics, such as integration of rest electricity and re renewable energy communities, uh, which are two new chapters, uh, sub-chapters for this year. Uh, all other chapters include data and analysis that are released only in the annual report, and our pro partners will provide you with the key messages in a moment. One last word um, to tell you that our website contains all the documentation we publish, which is more than uh, just uh, barometers uh, released every year, since there are uh, policy reports, policy files per country that describe the policy framework in each country. Um, and you can find as well interesting case studies on innovative financing schemes, which have been successful in supporting the development of REST project in some countries. 
um, you may find as well um, press uh, uh, press corner with press releases and tables and graphs from all the barometers that you can use uh, freely. And now, um, Frédéric, the floor is yours to present selected information from the energy chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Frédéric Thuyer, and I am a research manager at Observer. And now I'm going to, to present uh, the, the main information about energy indicators that uh, were, has been published in our uh, global barometer. And uh, I will focus my messages on the, the penetration of rest uh, sectors into uh, the European energy balance. Um, so uh, 2020, uh, has been a milestone for uh, the European Union in terms of uh, development of renewable sectors. It, each country had its own target to reach in terms of uh, share of renewable energies in gross final energy consumption, and all member states had to achieve a common target with a 20% share. But in 2021, uh, it was a new reference year because it's the first year in which the specific calculation provisions for uh, the rest penetration was done according to the renewable energy directive the new the new directive uh, also known as red 2 and so uh, that's why the, the results for the 2021 are therefore not uh, directly comparable to those for the previous year because as i said the calculation was different and the main changes in, to, in the met methodology concerns the inclusion of new sustainability criteria for solid and gaseous biofuels, but also a new method for calculating renewable electricity in transport. So the, this first um, slide is about uh, electricity generation and the share of renewable sectors into the electricity generation. So. Uh, Compared with uh, 2020, 2021 was not a good year for electricity output, renewable electricity, uh, because of a wind deficit that its uh, main European production areas, such as Germany, France, Belgium, Ireland, or Sweden. Uh, however, renewable energy's main strength is their diversity and complementarity. So the 10.9 um, terawatt hour drop in the wind energy across Europe was compensated by the other sectors, especially from solar, <clears throat> biomass, or in a lesser extent, uh, hydropower. So in 2021, a solar PV has uh, strengthened its position a little bit more because the sector has been the one that has progressed the most in terms of energy produced, and it has become the third important renewable sources for electricity behind hydropower and the first one, uh, wind power. However, despite that, 2021 renewable energy energies covered 37.1% uh, of the gross total electricity output in the EU27. And um, uh, so the, the renewable share has fallen from the 38.1% uh, uh, in 2020, but once again, the comparison is not uh, very easy to, to do because uh, the, the methodological, methodological base is not the same. And concerning the country's position, uh, we can see that uh, 15 member states were above a threshold of 30% uh, of rest in their electricity generation, and among, among which six uh, were above a 50% share. So now, uh, this second slide is about uh, the rest share in heat and cooling consumption. So according to uh, the data, renewable energy consumption used for uh, heating and cooling increased in uh, 2021 rising from uh, 105 um, million on, of ton oil equivalents to uh, more than 113 uh, million of tons. 
and the rest shares uh, has reached uh, 20.9% in 2021. This result is also, but there was a, a decrease compared to the previous year. And this result was explained by the methodological change, but uh, also uh, uh, because uh, of um, the significant increase in the total energy consumption uh, about uh, heat and cooling needs in 2021 compared to the previous year, which was a, a non-typical year marked by COVID confinements. Regarding the energy sources, solid biofuels remain the first sector with 75% uh, uh, of the total renewable heat production in Europe. But the most fast growing uh, trend is for heat pump sector, which reached 15 million ton oil equivalents and a share of 14% of the total uh, heat production from renewable. Um, this technology uh, has taken advantage of the policies in, in countries that have introduced the regulation in favor of this type of uh, equipment. And it was uh, uh, the case in France, Finland, uh, and Sweden or, or Italy. And concerning the country's status, not surprisingly, the renewable share is uh, in heat consumption is higher in forest countries, especially located in the northern part of Europe. And 13 member states uh, were above a 30% threshold, and four were above a 15% uh, threshold. As the opposite, three countries were under a 10% share. And now the, my last uh, slides are, are about the rest in the gross final energy consumption, which is the, the, the main uh, uh, rest indicators regarding the rest penetration. So um, 2021, as I said, uh, marks a new departure with a new reference, a new method. And so uh, for, that, uh, for that year, the, the rest shares was assessed at 21.8%. Uh, uh, but now the challenge ahead is huge, very huge, because this share will have to be more or less doubled until uh, 2030. Moreover, in, in the divergence for the previous directives, the European Union countries uh, no longer have to set formal national targets. Now there is a more common global targets in which all uh, member states has to, to, to participate. In May 2022, the Commission has introduced the Repower EU plan to raise the renewable energy target. And uh, the, the, the plan now is to, to reach a share of 45% uh, by 2030. So the purpose is to accelerate transition and gradually minimize the EU uh, energy reliance by accelerating uh, all, all the um, uh, renewable sectors. But as I said, the change is huge and all member countries now have less than eight years to reach their co collective global uh, goal. So thank you for your attentions and now I give the, the floor to um, Lynn for a new part. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, good morning to you all, or good day. I'm Lynn Jung from Fraunhofer Institute uh, for System and Innovation Research based in Germany. I will present the indicators related uh, to rest in building sectors on behalf of my colleagues, Julia Pani and Anna Billerbeck, who are unfortunately uh, not able to join today. These indicators aim to show the integration of renewables in the building stocks. And um, among the eight different indicators, I will present two indicators for the renewable heatings and two for renewable electricity. 
The first indicator to start with is the consumption share of renewable heating in residential buildings and services which is derived from the final energy demand data from Eurostat. The member states in the graph below is ranked by the share of renewables and waste heat. And we see the well-performed member states such as Sweden, Finland uh, lies on the right side of the graph. We also see in this uh, member states, there is a substantial share of uh, the orange bar which represents the district heating. And this brings us to the next indicators about uh, the renewable shares in district heating, where we look at the supply mix in these member states more in detail. Besides the fossil fuels in gray below, we see also a high share of bioenergy that is marked in green in the bars especially in member states with high share of uh, renewables, uh, the contribution of biomass or biofuels is substantial. In summary, we see uh, some dynamics in integrating renewables in the heating sector. Nevertheless, fossil fuels still play a dominating role in the heating sector. According to our analysis on the market stock share, which is unfortunately not shown today, the fossil fuel boilers are also the most commonly used technology in the sector and followed by district heating. As for renewable electricity in the building stock, we focus on the self-consumption share of solar PV in a selected uh, member states. And the figure below shows the first part of our empirical results from the four member states who have the highest electricity production and a self-consumption share of up to 21%. As for the second part of the results, these four member states have a relatively low electricity production. Nevertheless, they have comparably high self-consumption share between 16 to 45%. Besides the empirical approach, we have also conducted an economic approach to stimulate, simulate the optimal decision of, for households on if the produced electricity from PV should be self-consumed. And this is done by looking at the cost and economic benefits in each member states. And the results below shows that in most member states, it makes more sense to decide for self-consumption economically. And this is also the first takeaway we have uh, for our analysis. Nevertheless, if we compare with the uh, empirical results, it tells us that the reality could look quite different. Now we switch uh, to the investment indicators and these indicators refer to the asset finance in the newly built um, capacity in renewable technologies. Um, one more note uh, to this indicator, starting from this parameter, we have changed the data sources and methodology for it. Uh, one of the two main findings I want to present today is the investment activities in the wind sector. We see increasing investment volumes in, in both years and the investment reached almost 28 billion euros in 2021. And this is associated with a capacity added of 18 gigawatt, uh, which increased even stronger in comparison to the investment volume. If we zoom in the wind sector, also as shown on the figure uh, here, we see a shift of investment from offshore wind projects to onshore wind projects. In our analysis, we also conclude that uh, the investment cost for both uh, wind technology remains rather stable. As, as for solar photovoltaic, we see also increasing investment uh, over the years and the investment reached a volume of uh, 18 billion euro in 2020. 
for the year 2021, we have only limited information for 10 member states by the time we uh, conduct the analysis. Nevertheless, the investment volume and associated capacity added for these 10 member states have already exceeded the number achieved in 2020. In average, over one third of the investment in 2020 were made in plants with a capacity between 20 kilowatts uh, to one megawatt. This looks, however, differently from one member state to another. As for the uh, investment costs, this is uh, quite different from the uh, situation uh, for wind technologies. The special economic circumstances caused by pandemic led to increased investment costs for PV, in particular, the supply of the technology and the installation costs. And that's it from my side, and I'm handing it over to the next speaker, Flores from uh, TNO, and he will share some insights about socioeconomic indicators. Yes, thank you, Lynn. And uh, hi there, my name is Flores Schulman, and I will be presenting a few parts that uh, we've uh, covered in this report uh, in, at TNO. So I want to also thank my colleagues, uh, Luke, Sam, Matthew, and Avi for, for working with me on these parts. The first part uh, is the socioeconomic indicators. Um, six years ago, we developed a model uh, where we use an approach to estimate the turnover and employment for the technological sectors that we cover in this report. And uh, with this mathematical approach, we really try to uh, provide consistency over the years in the way we present our estimates. Um, we use uh, certain data as inputs, and every year we also update these data. So for example, the capacity installed, the production, and also trade of equipment. Uh, and every year we, we update these. So in the report, you can find the further uh, explanation of the methodology, um, and uh, I won't bother you with that right now. So maybe to share a few insights on this year's results. Um, here you can see a table of the turnover per sector. Um, we see that the turnover and employment have increased uh, compared to the previous year. So the, we can see here at the bottom, I don't know if you're able to read this, but there's a 185 billion uh, turnover in, to in, the, in the total uh, total turnover for all the technologies uh, this year, uh, which is an increase of about 22 billion toward, uh, compared to last year. Uh, employment has also increased a bit since last year um, to 1.47 million jobs. And interesting to see here that the biggest sectors are heat pumps, solid biomass, and wind energy. Um, one note on the, on the heat pumps is that we improved uh, the calculation method for heat pumps. Every year we try to evaluate our methodology again um, to provide the best estimates we can. And for this year, we've also included the replacements of uh, heat pumps uh, to which makes a better estimate uh, of the total amount of heat pumps installed. Um, a small note on this is that the, the results may seem like a big increase uh, from the last last year's results because they are also now included these replacements. Um, furthermore, we see that German, Italy, and France are the largest countries in terms of turnover. And, and employment, and also the gross value added, which is another indicator we uh, also share. Um, but uh, I, I won't show this in too much detail right now. You can find it in the report. Uh, but in general, the gross value added per sector shows similar trends as also the turnover we show here. Then, um, what are uh, important growth or declines that we see uh, at this stage? We see that the heat pumps um, have increased since uh, the last uh, year's report. Um, one of the main reasons is the, the reason I just told about the development of the uh, replacements that are now included in the calculation method, where the increase may seem a bit higher than uh, might have expected. But in general, it's, it's, it's more of an uh, the, it's a relative increase of about 18% and not a 
very large increase. We see, for example, a relative high increase for solar thermal due to a lot of new installations, but, in, but because it's a small sector still, the absolute uh, increase in jobs is not that high compared to uh, other sectors. We see a bit of a decline in the employment in the wind energy sector, but we can argue that um, because of the model really incorporates also the changes towards the results in last year and last year's uh, estimates, they included a lot of new installations of wind energy uh, compared to the new installations of this year, which in the end gives a small decrease in employment, but that doesn't mean that um, uh, the wind energy sector didn't really install a lot of, uh, of wind and therefore uh, a very big decrease in employment. So that is uh, also because it's a very big sector still, we see that it's just also the way we calculate these estimates that we see a decline in this case. Overall, we can see a, a fair increase in jobs, about 12% uh, for, renew for renewables. So about a, an increase of 157,000 uh, jobs. So that was a bit of an overview on the employment model and the results of that. And now I'll we'll dive into a bit of the costs, prices and competitiveness of uh, renewable energy, uh, of which I cover, we cover three things, the investment costs, the weighted average cost of capital and the levelized cost of energy. So first on the renewable energy costs, um, in the picture left below, uh, we, see you have, we see the levelized cost of energy per technology, um, where the average estimate is given with the, uh, with the black bar. Um, every year we update this, um, this indicator. We have a few input data that we uh, uh, update and also the new indicator, which I'll also show you in the next slide, which is the weighted average cost of capital. We've updated those, so we have a, a fairly new results on the levelized cost of energy. Um, but one note here is that we uh, did not um, change the investment cost that we put in as input data. This was due to the fact that there has been some volatile and uncertain trends in the investment costs, and also literature shows that there's quite a lot of variability in the uh, investments costs, for example, from IRENA and IEA reports, they show uh, a lot of variability between technologies and also between the different, between last years. So that is why for this year's report, we have assumed the same investment cost as 2020. So in the picture uh, right below, um, we see the same results uh, basically as last year for the investment costs. Nevertheless, we see uh, for the uh, cost that um, we see similar trends as the last year. So not a lot of new uh, mind blowing updates here. A quick overview on the weighted average cost of capital. Um, in last year's report, we included the, this indicator for the first time and we developed a methodology um, uh, for calculating this uh, WAC with a bottom up approach where we use uh, a few parameters um, which are publicly available, uh, which have publicly available data. Uh, and we use a few ex expert judgments to uh, derive some assumptions that underlie this. Um, we use this bottom-up approach and public data so that we can use the approach and the results for consistency over time. So we have an also, so we use this same methodology again this year. We updated the data and uh, one of the parameters maybe interesting to mention is the cost of equity. Um, we derived this from a Dutch from the Dutch subsidy scheme calculations. Um, this is basically the subsidy for sustainable energy production, which is used to subsidize um, projects for governments and uh, or for organizations and companies. And we uh, we altered this cost of equity uh, also with the risk free rates of each member state. And this will to give you a few other indications of what we use in this WAC methodology. Uh, one of them is the technology risk, which is important for the uh, for the update in the, in the WAC. So we can see, for example, that wind onshore and solar PV have quite a low 
technology risk, whereas uh, bioenergy and other technologies show a higher technology risk, which will in the end lead to a different uh, WAC. Two important updates on, um, on the indicators of last year. So uh, solar PV uh, project developers have increased their gearing level, which means they can finance more of their project with the same amount of equity. And that is why the debt to equity ratio here has increased to 90 over 10 uh, compared to last year's result, which was a bit lower. Um, furthermore, also for wind offshore, uh, the debt to equity ratio increased to 75 uh, over 25, uh, which basically means that also the capital costs are lower as debt is generally cheaper than equity to finance your projects with. This was a bit uh, of the methodology. You can find a lot more about this uh, and the parameters in the report. But just to give you a little overview on how such a table looks like, we've provided some low average and high estimates per technology and per member state. And a general, um, a general conclusion we see is that we see lower WAC values for countries that have, or for, for mature technologies, such as wind onshore and solar PV. And we see also lower WAC values for countries that have more stable and uh, economic and political conditions, and where there is more large-scale deployment of the technologies. On the other side, we see higher WAC values for the less mature technologies and also for countries with more unstable economic and political conditions. That was a bit on the WEC. I hope you had a bit of an idea on, uh, on the values here. You can find, of course, the, the real values per member state and technology in the report. Um, for now, I would like to thank you and give the word to Ilse. Yeah, thank you, Floris. And hello, everyone. I'm Ilse Morgens from VITO, and I'm an expert in energy and climate policy. I will present you uh, the results on the avoid avoided fossil fuel use and avoided costs and avoided greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, in, our to, in the topic center for climate mitigation, we yearly uh, look together with the European Environmental Agency to co-benefits of renewable energy. Co-benefits of renewable energy, these are uh, typically the avoided fossil fuel use and the avoided greenhouse gas emissions. We supplement this work with uh, the fuel costs to also uh, give an indication of that in the Europe server barometer. The fossil fuel types assumed to be substituted are uh, transport fuels. And for those, we typically uh, look at the diesel and gasoline as fossil fuels. For heating, we look at uh, a mix of gaseous petroleum products, um, solids and uh, non-renewable waste. And uh, for the fuels used for electricity uh, production, it's, it's again a mix of gaseous, solid and oil products. The fossil fuel uh, costs are uh, country specific in most cases for most uh, fuels. And they are uh, based on various uh, multiple sources like Eurostat, um, costs published by the European Commission and by NASDAQ. Um, similar as to the uh, variability costs of, of costs in investments, which uh, Floris uh, touched upon, also, of course, the fuel costs are very variable in time and also between countries. Um, here we see the result for the EU as a whole, and for 2021, we had uh, avoided fossil fuels of uh, 190, 192 megaton to be precise. Uh, the biggest part there uh, is related to avoided gaseous fuels, then followed by solid fuels in the light blue uh, part of the pie chart, and uh, followed by the petroleum products. Um, 
Then using the uh, fuel prices, uh, we can come to the avoided expenses and in the uh, lower figure, the result for the EU27 as a whole uh, is uh, incorporated and we come to uh, avoided cost of around uh, 80 billion uh, euros. And in this figure, it's uh, split into the different renewable uh, energy technologies for electricity, heat, and transport. And we see that a big part can be um, attributed to onshore wind, followed by um, the biodiesel uh, in transport. That's the green uh, part in, in, the, in the chart. Um, in the barometer, also figures uh, with results per country are included. A note with uh, this, these figures and with the um, methodology is that we uh, use 20, 2005 as a reference year because um, since uh, uh, progress achieved in, in the EU-wide renewable energy deployment since that year, is largely attributed to the presence of the uh, mandatory targets for 2020. Then uh, we have a look at avoided greenhouse gas emissions. Um, gross effects on greenhouse gas emissions are based on energy balance data available from Eurostat. Um, for primary energy consumption, and related to uh, CO2 emission, emission factors per fuel type from the European Commission. Um, the term cross avoided emissions uh, illustrates the rather theoretical character of the um, results. We, we uh, become this way and the contributions uh, as such do not necessarily represent net uh, greenhouse gas savings, they are not based on a life cycle assessments or on full uh, carbon accounting. And considering these kind of methodologies could lead, of course, to other uh, results. For 2021, for the EU as a whole, we come to avoided emissions of 600 megaton. And then comparing to the total EU emissions for 2021, which is around 3,500 megaton CO2 equivalent, we come to a reduction of around 15% um, in the total emissions uh, due to the use of renewable energy. And that was uh, the, the information I wanted to share with you on uh, renewables and avoided fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions. I give now the word back to Floris. Yes, thank you, Ilse. Oh, sorry. I will uh, now continue with the final parts of the presentation here, uh, which is more on the innovation and competitiveness of, uh, of the renewable energies. Uh, firstly, um, we show a picture of the private and public investments in research and development. Expenditure on research and development, uh, just over 800 million euros, um, followed by Japan and Germany, who, has a, who have slightly uh, lower public investments. Um, comparing, comparing those investments to the investments we make in the European Union, uh, we have almost 1 billion euros invested publicly in research in R&D. Um, so this gives an indication on uh, how we compare to, for example, the US. Um, furthermore, uh, we also show how much of the GDP is invested uh, in the research and development. Uh, and the European Union, or at least the 27 countries, invested about 0.0051%, uh, which is a bit uh, less than last year but not, uh, not too big of a decrease here, uh, we see in public investments. Interestingly, on the other side, we do see um, a few differences in the private investments. Uh, 
Um, by the way, uh, I note that the public investments, these figures are given for uh, 2020 and the private investments only for 2019, we have the latest uh, data, but you can find the, the, the further details of that um, in, in the tables in the report. I will show you a quick overview of one of the tables in a minute. Uh, but of the private investments, we see that Denmark and Germany show uh, quite extensively the highest uh, private investments with Denmark uh, leading um, with about 840 billion euros with a GDP share of about 0.34% and Germany following with uh, the second highest private expenditure of about 780 billion euros. Um, we see that the most private investments are made in the wind energy sector. Just over 50% uh, of the investments go to wind energy and about 30% to solar. Um, and the total investments of the EU27 uh, have decreased a bit to 2.5 billion euros in total. Uh, and also the GDP share have, in, have decreased a bit to 0.017% uh, of the GDP share devoted to the private investments. Um, so these are in line with each other as well. Uh, note that for the public investments, um, China is not included as a different uh, country. And for the private investments, we don't have data for uh, comparing to other countries outside of the EU. So that is something to take into account when uh, reading, the, reading the results here. Uh, overall, we can see that the private investments exceed the public investments by quite a bit. So 2.5 billion uh, in, the, in the EU27 uh, for private investments and about 1 billion for public investments. And furthermore, yeah, we see that um, the, the, big, the biggest countries following Denmark and Germany are France, Spain and Netherlands for the, uh, yeah, for the private investments. More tables like these can be found in the report. Uh, one final overview we would like to present today is about the international trade of renewable energy technologies. Um, this is an indicator that we also included in the latest years. And uh, I will show you a picture in a brief time, which might make the uh, idea of import and export more um, clear. Overall, we see that uh, EU has a relatively strong position um, concerning renewable energy technologies mainly in wind power, we were about 72% um, of the exports of wind energy come from Europe, uh, with Denmark, uh, sorry, Germany and Denmark being the, being the leaders there. We are also leading in biofuels in Europe, where the Netherlands and France and a few other countries uh, show the biggest exports, about 46% of the total uh, exports. And furthermore, hydropower, um, uh, are also at a similar level, about 40% of the exports come from Europe. And we are second in uh, PV, uh, just after uh, the one of the biggest exports, of course, China. CN is here, China, of course, and CH is Switzerland. Um, so we see that uh, as China has quite a strong position in the exporting PV, about 45% of the total exports, and they are second in wind power and hydro behind uh, the EU27. Lastly, we see that for biofuels, um, the US and Brazil show quite big exports. Um, and it is good to uh, note a few visualizations of these exports. So these are in general pictures that we show per technology, but also for the total uh, export figures here, where we see the export and import per technology uh, with each country. So for example, here we see that we have like a neg we have a negative export uh, trade exporting trade balance with China, Japan, and Brazil. But we have a positive uh, export trade with uh, the US, the UK, and a few other countries. So, if you would like to see more of these um, figures uh, to see where we are leading, where we are, um, yeah, where where other countries are leading uh, per technology into the trade. Uh, feel free to look at the report. We see overall that European Union has still a competitive uh, place in this international trade. Um, 
where we've lost we've lost quite a bit of wind, about eight percent of the trade in compared to last year, to uh, to China. Uh, but the other uh, trade positions uh, remain relatively the same. This was, I think, the last uh, part that I at least wanted to present. And I think I would like to give the floor back to uh, Christoph. Yes, thank you very much, Floris. And also a uh, big thanks to uh, my other colleagues who have just presented here. And Floris just mentioned it already. Um, in, this, in this presentation and in this webinar, we were only able to present some of the very key results. Um, so the uh, report, um, as well as the presentation, uh, can be downloaded from our website. Um, the report is uh, more than 160 pages strong um, with mostly quantitative but also some qualitative data collected on the state of renewable energies in Europe um, in, uh, in the 2021, uh, in the year of 2021. So um, I already see that there are some questions in the chat and I would like to ask uh, uh, our partners to switch on their videos. Um, as I, uh, I see already here, um, the first question might concern all of you directly. Um, it's uh, from Roman, our uh, one of our alumni actually uh, of the Europe Server Consortium. And um, yeah, it's a comment plus a question. So um, let me read this out uh, to the partners. So Roman says, uh, energy or so, uh, social economic indicators, we all know it is hard to predict the future. But concerning the Ukraine war, and I think Roman has a has an important point over here, this changed around uh, our energy system quite a lot last year. So does, uh, uh, do you uh, expect, and I think I can direct this to, to all of our colleagues, um, that uh, this uh, event will speed up the uh, European energy transition or rather delay the switch to renewables in the coming years. So um, maybe I give uh, the floor to uh, all of you who want to, to answer to this because I think this is related to all of our indicators. So maybe I start with uh, Frederic or Diane. Um, do you have any? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So I, I could say a, a word about that. So at first, and I salute uh, uh, Roman. And uh, uh, yes, the, but the idea is that um, the Ukraine crisis uh, should speed up the transition. And uh, last year, the repower plan was done in that purpose. But uh, added to the Ukraine crisis, there is also the climate change challenge, which is more and more uh, threatening and and aftermaths of global warming is more and more visible. So we need to accelerate. But the, the question is, uh, the que questions are uh, on the industrialists of forest sectors and developers, investors, et cetera. Are they ready to, to level up their activity in a very short or, or, or reason and then by keeping um, affordable energy costs and prices? That's the first part. And the other part is, um uh, the question about the conditions around project development regarding the administrative procedures they have to be to be fluid in all the european countries and at the same time these procedures uh, have to take into account more and more um environmental factors such as biodiversity the protection of biodiversity recycling aspects of the equipment etc and connected to that, there is a, a question of the big challenge of the social acceptance of rest plants, new rest plants across Europe. So uh, it's uh, more and more challenging, but the idea is to to to, yeah, to speed up the, the transition. Uh, and we hope that it will be the this is the case. Thank maybe. you, Frederic. Yeah. Yes, and uh, maybe Lynn, uh, do you have any sort of like projections that you could share um, that maybe for the heating and cooling sector um, in general and in buildings as well? Thanks for directing the question to me because I was just about to raise my hand. Um, yes, uh, I see this uh, two-sided. Uh, from the one side, we see a lot of uh, in, uh, or a lot of mo momentum in a new installation of heat pumps and also solar PV in households. On the other side, we also see a shortage of uh, the supply of this technology and also the increasing investment costs that I mentioned just now. So I think the transition will be pushed forward but also has a lot of uh, challenges thank you so much lynn um flores ills uh, you you also have the chance to to respond to roman's question in case you like of course 
Maybe one thing, we also do research in other domains uh, besides the work we do uh, for the Topic Center. And recently I saw a presentation of a colleague on, on the adequacy and security of supply and all the networks that need to be installed to getting the renewable electricity where it is needed. So that's also something to keep in mind, I think, in the acceleration of the transition. Um, maybe not directly touched upon yet in the barometer, but um, it's, it's an important uh, uh, aspect, to my opinion. Thank you very much, Ilse. Um, Flores, you, you could have the last word, but the next two questions will also be directed at you. So I don't know if you, if you want, still want to respond to Roman's question. Yeah, I think I think a lot has been said already. Um, I think maybe uh, for, for us a, a good takeaway of all these volatile uh, conditions is that we should be very careful in in how we address uh, these types of uh, indicators now. So I think it's very good to be critical on the way we develop these methodologies and our assumptions on 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 big on these bigger changes. So I think that's uh, that's also just very good to take uh, take into account when. Uh, when going forward with these type of uh, of developments. Thank you so much, Flores. Um, I have a question from Carlos, and um, he would like to know um, if you work with indicators that could provide information on the quality of the jobs created, um, as he thinks that the, this would give uh, a better picture on the subject than just showing estimations of created jobs. Mm, yeah, interesting question. Um, I think at the moment we do not we cannot really say something about the, the quality uh, of jobs per se as we have a few um, indicators and input data which we put into the model where we really distinguish where the jobs are created and what type of jobs serve are the more maintenance jobs operational jobs so we distinct we do distinguish the, the types of different jobs that um, we estimate that people work in um, and we take things like salaries maybe into account, but um, we do not cover the, the real quality, qualitative analysis of the type of job. So that will require a lot of further analysis, which we do not do at the moment. But it's an, uh, it's an interesting question, I think. Um, and um, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there are some, some other um parties that do know more a bit more about the quality but uh, at the moment our model does not incorporate uh, the exact quality yet. all right thanks a lot uh, flores um i see there's two more questions i think we have exactly enough time for those so maybe flores quick uh, question quick answer does the eu 27 number on the r d uh, um, investments um, does it also include eu level funding for example from horizon europe or does it only sum up the the um, funding from the member states Floris, you're still you're muted i think um it 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 really goes on a on the eu level uh, funding but to be honest, I'm not a hundred percent sure which exactly uh, which uh, type of. I can I in. can say something here. Uh, you have uh, the in the barometer. You have the two uh, two de separate sum that are uh, described. So you have the EU uh, Commission budget plus the EU total sum of uh, the expenditure for uh, by the different member states. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Now, last question. Um, how would you characterize the trend in trade? Is it worsening over time and is it significant? For example, is trade an important share of overall deployment in the various technologies or is it only marginal? Uh, interesting question. Um, I think it, uh, the, if, you, if you wanna look at what is better or worse, uh, I guess we, you get into a lot more political uh, discussions on what is uh, what is best for for the European Union. Uh, I think we're not in a in a position to really say something very accurate on that. I think we do see a, a trend that the um, the love the balancing of trade of the European Union compared to other countries is uh, getting a bit less. So we so the total renewable energy 
exports of the European Union are decreasing slightly. Um, but we'll also have to see how that will develop in the coming years with other developments within these sectors. So I think, uh, yeah, interesting discussion to also have uh, with, with, with the people working uh, in, in, these, uh, in these sectors and also on a, on a more higher level to see what is really good or worse for, uh, for this trade development. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Flores. And also thank you uh, to the audience uh, for, for your questions. And you already see here on the slide, um, I mentioned it already, presentation and report will be available for download. I also posted the link uh, um, in the chat already for the report. Um, you also see here the database. And I think this is something worth mentioning towards uh, to the end of this webinar as um, all the data that um, uh, the Europe Server Consortium is collecting. Um, as I know, there are some of you uh, uh, listening here from from academia, you might be writing reports. All the data is freely accessible um, via this database, um, so um, you can you can access this via EuropeServer.org, um, where you find all the different thematic and overview parameters, some downloads, data, the methodology reports, press releases, presentations. You can follow us on Twitter and also subscribe to our email newsletter. And um, with this being said, um, I would like to thank our our speakers, um, our, my, uh, our partners from the consortium. Um, I would like to thank you, the audience, for participating um, and yeah, um, giving us some of your one uh, uh, valuable time, and also our um, sponsors from the European Commission. So um, I thank you very much for this. Um, I wish you a great day and uh, we'll see you uh, next year around this time for, for the next uh, um, Overview Barometer webinar. So thanks again. Have a great, uh, have a great afternoon and bye-bye.